Hello, welcome back to April Space 12.12, .12, Moonshine, we are back. Can you hear me right now, Tanhony? Yeah, I can. <laughs> There's like a two second delay right now between when I say something and when you respond. The video is, is still uploading. Is there anything with your internet? Uh, that's probably why. Okay, no worries then. As long as the time's actually synced. Anyways, yes, welcome back. Sorry, audience. 12.12 um, <laughs> 12 Moonshine. Anything you want to say before we get started? Uh, nothing I can think of. Right, I'll jump right into it. <clears throat> I hope you won't hold such tactics against me, King said softly, knife waving through the air. I work to eat, after all. Muzazi smiled, despite the drop of sweat trickling down his forehead. He drew his own blade back. Oh, not at all, he said. You need such tactics to survive, after all. King snorted in amusement. Sixteen! A second. It was enough time for a child to take a single breath. It was enough time for a songbird to let out the tiniest cry. It was enough time for a boot to crackle against gravel but once. It was enough time for knife and sword to clash sixteen times. An aurora of light and aether swept across the rooftop as Muzazi and King clashed, twin tendrils of white crawling across their bodies. Muzazi swiped his radiant at King's head, who ducked underneath the blow, choosing not to counter but instead to plunge his kitchen knife into the surface of the roof itself. Another radiant ignited on Muzazi's free hand, ready to stab at the prone old man, but silver ratio, king in tone. At the very moment he would have thrust the blade forward, his footing was lost. The roof beneath Muzazi suddenly collapsed! I was just talking about Nanami, <laughs> this is crazy. All structure lost in an instant as it went from a construction of tiles and bricks to a simple collection of those same unconnected objects. Thrusters on Muzazi's feet enabled him to flip backwards, evading a slash of king's knife. But the destruction of the rooftop spread outwards, opening up a massive hole into the pitch-black building beneath. There, floating in the air as he watched his enemy warily, Muzazi caught his breath for the first time in the spout. He named his ability before the rooftop collapsed. Silver ratio. What does it do? After he stabbed the roof, all connection between its components was lost. Disassembly, then? Reducing the target to its base of materials? If that's the case, I can't afford to let my body be hit even once. Is that an attack he needs that knife to use, though? Or can he activate the ability from any point of contact? I need to keep my distance. King passed his knife from one hand to the other, regarding Muzazi with narrowed, predatory eyes. As expected, destroying the ground doesn't do much to throw him off balance. But it'd be far too pessimistic to call it useless. Skilled as he may be, there will be a definite difference in maneuverability when he doesn't have solid footing to rely on. If I keep him in the air, he has to divide his focus between flying and swordplay. Keep him in the air until night arrives, and that should be right about now. The movement was so fast that it almost seemed like teleportation. One second Muzazi was alone in the air, and the next a stick-thin figure had appeared behind him, leg pulled up for a devastating kick. Mandibles clicked together as the newcomer cackled madly, leg coming down like a hammer. That never met its target. F! I yes! At the last second, a long, thin tendril of purple fog lashed out from within the building and deflected the attack, protecting Muzazi from harm. Through it all, the full moon never broke eye contact with King, not even glancing over his shoulder at the thing that had nearly killed him. I'm sorry to say this, he said calmly, looking down at his adversary, but you're not the only one who can play unfair. The massive sphere that was Bishop paused in the air, his journey towards a toy Muzazi halted by the man in front of him. Marcus Grace sat on the windowsill of an apartment, legs dangling over the river below, calmly polishing his pistol with a handkerchief. His electric blue eyes glanced up towards Bishop, suspended in the air above the water. There was nothing but dismissal in that gaze. Fair warning, he said calmly, but if you move any closer, I'm going to have to kill you. Click, he flipped off the safety. Rook paused mid-step, his boot crushing the skull of the man beneath him, before whirling around. With military reflexes, he calmly aimed all of his cannons and barrels at the single man approaching him from down the alley. The single old man. Who the hell are you? He growled, acidic saliva dripping from his lips and sizzling upon the floor. Ash Del Durin, hands clasped behind him as he walked with a slight hunch, looked up with dull eyes. A shiver went down Brooke's spine. He didn't know who this guy was, but he knew a killer when he saw one. The cannon on his arm began to glow with an in entire green light. Oh, eerie, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say eerie green light. Come on, then! Rook spat green. Ash cracked his neck. 
raising his arms and assuming a flexible water stance. Let's make this quick, he croaked. I don't have much time. Pawn had intended to head straight for a toy Muzazi, straight for his revenge. Who's Pawn? Hmm. Yeah? Who could he be? I don't know. You tell me. Perhaps we'll find out soon. But the power he had in this form was simply intoxicating! He slammed the colossal fist against the nearby skyscraper, savoring the way the structure just gave under his pressure. Excess heat from his movements vented out from his prosthetic foot, his fusion tool incinerating whatever unfortunate still remained below. It didn't matter how much stronger a toy Musazi had become. It didn't matter how much more skilled he might have been. Against sheer overwhelming force like this, there was nothing anybody could do but die. His eyes, each the size of a car, swiveled to face the far-off bell tower a toy Muzazi was fighting at. It was fighting at. No, no, he couldn't lose himself in the thrill of destruction just yet. He had to get over there and crush that worm before that asshole king beat him to it. The earth shook as Pawn took another thundering step forward, and... Yo, said Gregory yes. Wait, why are they all helping him? I thought they hated Muzazi. Well, these are the guys that are, like, on in his side. Gregory's on his side? I thought he's Gregory like, was like, unknown. He's an unknown, oh, no, yeah, but this is, like, a, maybe a test as well. <laughs> See what he mm. is. Yo, said Gregory Hazard, standing on a rooftop next to Pawn's head, hands plunged into the pockets of his coat. You're pretty big, huh? The only thing that stopped Pon's eye from being sliced out then and there was the infusion he poured into his face at the last second. As a result, the wounds that marked his skin, slowly oozing blood, were shallow, painful, but not life-threatening. All the same, the massive man staggered backwards, seizing hold of the building he just launched to keep himself upright. He just... punched to keep himself upright. Gregory raised an eyebrow at the unsightly display. All I did was scratch you, dude. I didn't, I didn't expect Gregory to be so informal. What voice should I give him? Uh, he's sort of like a bored guy. He's like, maybe like this. All I did was scratch you, dude. One hand was out of his pocket now, if it could still be called a hand. His entire arm had been warped and flattened into a long, sharp blade, blood dripping from the end. Gregory shook it off onto the rooftop next to him. Paper Moon, Gregory Haz Hazard's aether ability, allowed him to flatten and fold anything as if it were made of paper. By utilizing a combination of that folding and his skill at infusion, he could transform various parts of his body into weapons. That was just the simplest application of his ability. Damn it! Pawn seethed, the air rumbling from the mere force of his voice. He clumsily wiped the blood from his face with a hand. Don't you make a fool of me! But it's so easy. Gregory hopped off the top of the roof onto a jutting out length of... Of rubble. <laughs> Length of rubble, strolling across it like a pirate walking the plank. He stopped at the end of the protrusion, at eye level with the hunched-over giant, blade arm extended. Then, the slightest smirk tugged at his lips. I know how much punishment you can take now, he said. Not very impressive. I hate doing tiring things, so I'm going to eliminate you quick, okay? Those gargantuan eyes narrowed further into a gargantuan glare. You won't stop me, he whispered. You won't stop me from reaching a toy Muzazi. Gregory raised his eyebrows. Wow, sounds like a real personal thing. Too bad you couldn't find someone who cared. Popcorn. The tendril of purple fog looped around Knight's thin ankle, forming a gaseous shackle, and then smashed him downward, slamming his body against the rooftop. His yell of pain was nearly drowned out by the shattering of tiles, and the trunks of destroyed architecture slid off the roof and into the water below. You really need to watch your back more, Commander, Morgan Knott said, hopping out the hole in the building. The other end of that fog rope was wrapped around his sword. Muzazi didn't look at him, instead keeping his eyes fixed on King. That's what I have you for, is it not? Morgan chuckled. Oh, you're too kind. The old man called King laughed in amusement too, twirling his knife between two fingers as he took in the scene before him. Knight counted... Um... Knight had been countered right before he could make his lightning-fast sneak attack, and the rest of his squad were stopped in their tracks as well. This really wasn't how things normally went, or how I'd expect them to go in this case, but no matter. For that matter. So you've brought so you've brought allies in with you, King asked. That's a surprise. I'd heard you were a bit more straight-laced than that. Mizazi's frown deepened. Despite how successful this gambit had been, he still couldn't help but feel deep shame. One couldn't call this anything but cheating. I mean, it's not cheating if he brings more people first. <laughs> I guess the fact that he brought them in to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. 
3,200 out of melees, he said softly. It wasn't difficult to have my men enter and win under false names. And you somehow all got assigned this arena as a group? King asked. I find that difficult to believe. There's a procedure for a cassette contestant to request a specific battlefield, given they meet some conditions first. Because as he said, it's a long forgotten piece of legislation, but my comrade here is adept at that sort of thing. Morgan strolled across the roof towards his prone opponent, wrapping the fog tighter around his prone adversary. Around his blade, that should be, actually. <laughs> he winked at King. Sorry, he said, but I'm a little bit of a bastard like that. Yes, Mizzily thought, he's forgotten laws. Disgraceful. He couldn't help but think of the sin that was looming in his future, the one he wanted to avoid at all costs, the one he feared more and more that he wouldn't be able to. Well, that's very interesting to know, King said, like falling back in, into his firm grip. To think you'd go to all that effort just to counter me and my men. In actuality, while we expected someone to target Muzazi, the plan, this plan had been put together more than anything just to ensure his own victory. The phases would work as a team to eliminate the rest of the contestants, and then they would all surrender Bar Muzazi, making him the winner by default. Repulsive yet effective. Something interesting, though. King hadn't known about that forgotten piece of ruling, so he hadn't used it to have himself and his men assigned here. Another method, then? Someone on the organizational committee had pulled the strings for him? Absolutely, Dragon's the one who hired these killers, right? There's no way it wasn't him. Mm. Dragon was like, do this, whoever the guy on the board is, I forgot his name, or I will fucking murder you. Don't concern yourself with that now. As he pulled his radium back, you can find out all about it once you defeated him. Knight, said King calmly, get the subordinate out of here. Bang! With a flash of red aether, the one called Knight leapt up and kicked off the ground, setting off at an absurd speed into the distance. Morgan, connected to the fused warrior by the fog rope, grimly kept hold of his sword as he was pulled along, his feet kicking up a torrent of shredded tiles when they skidded against the ground. Even as he was pulled away, though, his eyes flipped back to Mazaz and he called out, Don't die until I get back! As he glanced at the young man for the first time as he was dragged out of sight. The same to you. No, sorry, that's not Mazaz, that's King. The same to you. <laughs> They're so similar. King cocked his head, his knife grip, grip, gripped backhand adjusting his footing as he prepared to resume his attack. And as he watched her intently, in what form would the assault come? More attempts to stab or something more indirect? Had he perhaps been preparing the attack through seemingly innocuous movements this entire time? An Aether battle was a clash between opposing paranoias. The one who let their guard down first lost. Is that really all right? He asked, jerking his head in the direction that Morgan had left. I've only known this knight for a short while, but he's no slouch in combat. What will you do when your second in command is slaughtered? Mizazi smiled. Morgan won't lose, he said, more confident in that than his own victory. It's impossible for him to lose to some hired gun. He has the desires to fight for greater than your petty wish to get paid. For the first time, that slight smile dropped from King's lips, and he looked at Mizazi with a dull and merciless glare. White aether crackled along the surface of his knife. With a voice closer to a growl than his previous dignified cadence, he spoke. That self-delusion, he said coldly, as if Muzazi had insulted him personally. Reasons, ideals, dreams, all of them are meaningless. One person will get unlucky and die. That's all there is. That's all there's ever been. A chill ran down Muzazi's spine. It was clear now oh, that, until now, this man had just been playing with him, testing him, gauging his strengths and weaknesses, preparing himself. But now that was over. A look in his eyes, that bottomless abyss of blue, it told us that's the only one thing loud and clear. The moment this man got a chance, he would murder him. <gasps> Popcorn. Marcus aimed his pistol at the incoming perfect sphere, balancing on the windowsill. Bang, bang, bang! Three shots bounced harmlessly off the sphere's chassis. He clicked his tongue as the enemy continued their inexorable approach. Looks like this might be tricky, he said, his gaze steady and unyielding. He allowed himself to fall backwards through the window into the building, and continued his strategic retreat as the perfect sphere tore through the room behind him. He ran calmly, arms pumping, mind racing. First things first, he had to find this thing's weakness, its imperfection. Um, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> as charged down the hallway, weaving through the barrage of incoming acid shots, eyes closed as he allowed the air pressure to guide him. Each shot missed by mere centimeters, stray drops sizzling at his clothing, but never reaching his skin. In two seconds, Ashdell Durin crossed the entire distance between himself and his enemy, and slammed his palm into their chest. Black Timer! 
This was not an Aether technique. Oh yeah, that's his catchphrase. I forgot. Yeah, but he does some crazy <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah. He's like, Hold on, allow me to explain ten paragraph explanation of how this is martial arts. He's the only it's Baki a... character. <laughs> I was about to say, it's some Baki shit. I love it. <laughs> With a mighty roar, vomit green Aether sparking around his teeth and tongue. Pawn threw his fist at the time. Vomit? Wait, Vomit Green. Who do we know with Vomit Green Aether? Uh, no one. We know Piss Yellow. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. Pawn threw his fist at the tiny pest before him, and that tiny pest vanished. Pawn's face spread into a massive giddy grin. He'd done it! Had he done it? Had he sent the bastard flying? Pain. Pawn looked down at the hand he just struck the building with and saw that it could only generously be called a hand. Each finger individually the size of a car. Hold on. Tranquil, there you go. Because I was going to say, you said the eyes were carved. Yeah. If you put your finger to your eye, you would know that's not in scale. <laughs> Had been My cleanly persona. severed <laughs> cleanly severed at the knuckle, blood pouring copiously from the far wounds. The digits splashed into the rising water below. Whoa! Pawn gaped uncomprehendingly. What? The answer came quick. Like I said, Gregory replied, standing on Pawn's shoulder, speaking right into his ear. You're easy to kill. <laughs> Knight laughed cheerfully, his running form a blur as he sped across the rooftops, pulling Morgan with him. What's wrong? What's wrong, Morgan? Not! Can't keep up? Can you not keep up, Morgan? Even as he flailed his hair. Easy! <laughs> Easy! Even as he flailed. <laughs> that should have been their ad for the inner melees. <laughs> Even as he flailed through the air, having long since lost his own footing, Morgan couldn't help but let a wry smirk cross his lips. This bastard sure was running his mouth. It was like he was drunk on his own speed. Well, Morgan didn't mind fighting a drunkard. It made them stupid. He planted his hand against the rooftop beneath him, ignoring the way the skin was scraped off his palm, and spoke one letter inside his mind. I! King clutched his knife in both hands and lowered his body to the ground, his glaring eyes fixed intensely on Muzazi. His pupils were pinpricks, his face set into the countenance of a murderer. White aether ran between his lips as he spoke. Fusion tool, he declared. Zarathustra. Muzazi watched intensely as the old man was consumed by a pillar of white aether, readying himself for the attack that would surely come. He'd anticipated someone would try to eliminate him during the inner melee, but the weapons these people used meant it was the party he'd least wanted it to be. The creator of the fusion tools, Gretchen Hale. The woman who'd certainly been killed, but was definitely still alive. Very well, Muzazi thought, raising both radiance up from his palms. Let's have you tell me all about her. King! And then, without waiting another moment, he swooped in and slashed at the glowing pillar. You fool, the last time someone turned into a pillar of aether, you only lasted ten seconds. <laughs> I remember it like it was yesterday. Oh man, that was a good. Didn't one. learn your lesson, huh? That one felt like it passed too fast. I need I'm sorry. More. <laughs> no, don't apologize. I just meant like it was good. Are you hype? Was it hype? As they say, <laughs> it was hype. Yeah, yeah. It, there was a lot of fights going on, so not too much has happened yet. But um, it was good. A lot of good setup. Uh, here we go. J T asks. What's the tourism like for the final church ships? Are you actually asked me this in the uh, voice before, so I'll, I'll give the answer I gave then. Sure. <laughs> uh, so he asked about the Eliza. Um, so you wouldn't see a lot of, like, standard tourism. You'd see, like, tech people basically coming on to look at their crazy tech and stuff. There'd probably be, like, a few restaurants, like, on the lower decks. There's very limited access, though, because, of, of course, they got all those secrets about how they're not real people and not all AIs. <laughs> right, right. What about the other ships? Uh, the other ships... The humorous one is where you'll find a majority of the tourism. That's like much more of a bustling sort of hive of, of uh, commerce. And wow, that. look at how these people make do with only garbage. <laughs> Just like walking through with your camera. Well, it's more like, <laughs> that's where you'll find like, not even like people from the church, people like merchants coming there to do stuff when there's guarantees to be a lot of people around. Uh, and well, the... isn't that interesting? Because humorous whole thing is like, don't make stuff, just use what already exists. Yeah. Wouldn't they hate that? That's the scripture, but we, we know that uh, that's the, the, the level of adherence that depends on who you are, basically. What was the fourth book again that was, like, all of its bullshit? It was, uh, like, a hidden know. heretics book that was, like, all of That wasn't, all like, the... a fourth. That was, like, a minor cult, basically. It was a completely different, like, religion. That but what did the, it say again? It was had a really... Silencio. Yeah. What was its whole thing again? 
Uh, well, Silentia was basically like death, basically. So it was like a bit of death worship. Right, but th- there was like a, f- a, a passage about like how... Uh, I'll have to find it. You wrote a passage at the beginning of one of the chapters that like really stuck out to me in, a, in an interesting way. I'm trying mm-hmm. to remember it. I don't want to go through 50 <laughs> chapters of Arcanine and then find it. Um, Alright, and then... Uh, oh, here's an interesting one. Quaker asks... Sorry if this was already explained and I forgot, but why does the Humilist Church have such a high Skurrent population? Uh, well, basically, the Skurrents um, do have a bit of, like, difficulties, because, of course, some of them have medical requirements, stuff like that, so a lot of them are, like, sort of dispossessed, that sort of thing, and the, the Humilists are just sort of very welcoming towards those groups. I would also imagine medically, right, um, because I know biology, biological studies forbidden, like, well, not necessarily all biological. It's genetic engineering, specifically. Right, right. But, like, pugnans, cogitants, uh, umbrans, crownless are well understood enough, but it's probably harder to get good medical treatment if you're, like, it's an elephant man or whatever yeah. the fuck, yeah. Because you're not necessarily common. In some cases, you're, like, a species of one, basically. Y- yeah. Yeah, because to my understanding, scurrents were anywhere from, like, I made a whole planet of these kind of people because I love them. and Or it was, like, I made one guy fucked up and somehow... It's basically, in. yeah, any that isn't um, one of the main four is a scurrent. Yeah. Um, and, and it's probably harder to, like, get by in society as a result because, like, society yeah. doesn't necessarily know how to accommodate and some Del Day away. It's like we simply cannot accommodate <laughs> cat girls. Yeah. And if you don't have the money to ha- get special accommodations made or the, or the power to use Aether and do so, you probably rely on a more charitable organization like Humanism, where they, like, take care of you. Exactly. I would imagine. You pretty much got it, yeah. Um, and then do you want to do one more? Should we save Knight Lavitz's question for next time? Um, what is it? He says, are martial arts like b- boxing, karate, BJJ, and the like still watched as large sporting events, or have Aether Sports replaced them with some new variation? Um, you would still, like, in a traditional sense, like, Tree of Might would probably, like, enjoy that sort of thing. Like, the sort of, like, views. Because well, that's, my, like... Because they're very, like, toxic masculine, basically. Right, right. Well, my take on it, and correct me if I'm wrong, was I was under the assumption that when it came to sports and martial arts, there was, like, the normal league, and then there was, like, the Aether League, which yeah, yeah, was, yeah. like, you're well, allowed to well, use Aether. Power, of course, like, Aether might get more attention because it has cool powers, is what I mean. But, like, yeah, yeah. they watch it and be like, this is how it should be. <laughs> Yeah, hell yeah. Well, like no re- gimmicks, but, but like I imagine Fox even only, just like Final Destination this in, is in the not Aether League, I imagine you can't even use like reinforcement because that'll oh, uh, absolutely. That's that'd be like a big scandal. It's like yeah, he's doping. He's using reinforcement. I can see the he's crackle. Cloaking. Yeah, he's cloaking. He's cloaking. <laughs> Jabbing yourself full of Aether. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess that's everything then. Uh, Thank you guys for watching, as always, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye!